With the word mother comes a great requirement. You can't... That w- the, the mother has great implication. It means that you're a parent. It means that you have a child. And not only are you in charge of taking care of this person's well-being, their health, their, uh, all their needs... You're not just in charge of their education and where they're going in life, but you're also in charge of what goes into their mind. And this is probably the most important part. You have the physical needs, the physical needs that need to be met, but also you have the mind which needs to be influenced for right, for good things. We all know the difference when we see a good kid and a bad kid. We know the difference. And it is our responsibility as parents to influence our children for right things. And we are, we are responsible for those things. So important. So you can either be a good mom or a bad mom. You got a choice. And uh, I'm going to go... Oh, yes. Ephesians 6.4 says, Bring up your children in the nurture, the admonition. Admonition means the fear. Meaning that you are, are, you feel the responsibility. You know that God's going to hold you accountable for how you influence, how you raise, what you input into your children. And you see, that is so important. When you actually think, is this what God would want me to do want me to say, is this how God would want me to behave, want my children to behave? See, that changes how you think. In the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, it says in the Old Testament, train up your child in the way that he should go. So that means there's a way that people should go. There is a difference between wrong and right. No, Johnny, you can't do that. Amen? Amen? That's what the Proverbs say. Train up your child in the way he should go. There's a way we got to follow. There is a right and a wrong. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. We're going to go in the Old Testament and learn of a story. Uh, and we're going to have some background here. And this is the background in 1 Samuel 6, verse 1. The Ark of the Lord. If you don't know what the Ark of the Lord is, that's okay. It was basically a, a, a box. That's all you don't, you don't need to know anything about it. The Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what it is, that's fine. It was captured from Israel and taken to the country of the, say it, Philistines for seven months. And when they had taken the Ark of the Covenant, when the Ark of the Lord, when they captured the Ark of the Lord, God visited the country of the Philistines with plagues and He was showing them who God was. You see, the country of the Philistines had a god. They had Dagon, their god, and it was an idol, and they served that idol. And then God showed up and said, you're not God. He didn't say it, but he was showing them through the great miracles that he was doing. And they came to the priest and said, priest, what do we need to do to get rid of this bad stuff going on? And they said that you need to do all this stuff so that you can give what? Glory unto the God of Israel. So this country, the Philistines, this nation, at one point they, gave, they had to understand that God was God and He deserved glory and honor. So, this is important. We have all heard this story of, what are, who are these guys? David and Goliath, that's right. Forty years later, 1 Samuel 17, 33, This is later, and here is Goliath, this great warrior. He's grown up. And Saul, the king of Israel at that time, said to David, David's the good guy, okay, he's the one slinging the stone. Saul's the king, and David's this little runt. And he said to David, you're a youth. And he, who's he? Goliath is a man of war, has been a man of war from his youth. And you see, Goliath, he was raised, he was born of a giant, and he was raised to be a killer. He had influence from someone. Amen? He had parents. His mom and dad 
knew what they were doing. They knew he was going to be a giant, and they trained him to be a warrior. They disciplined him, put him in all the training that he could go to become a, a, a warrior, a, a sword fire, a javelin thrower, everything. He was awesome. And when he showed up on the scene, he was a giant. He was huge, and he could do, he could fight. He had great discipline. And it goes on to say, in 43, verse 43, the Philistine, that is Goliath, he cursed David by who? His gods. And when you see the little g, that means it's the little g. <laughs> it's not God. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the idol, Dagon, his gods. And you see, his parents did not influence him to serve God, even though they were alive when God visited the country of the Philistines with all of those things. You see, they had an opportunity to respond to what God did in their nation. And they refused. They saw what God was doing and they said, no, I'm too prideful. I'm doing, I believe in my own God. My idol Dagon is the one to go. And Dagon is... He's in, he's in the temple and his arms are cut off and he's flat on his face before the Ark of the Covenant because that's what God did. He did it all by himself. Didn't need any help. That's how powerful God is. If you've got to read that story, remember it's just an idol. Relax. And he was disciplined to fight. So you have this, these mothers. You have this mother. You have this father who did not influence their child for right. In fact, they raised them to do the wrong thing. And they had an opportunity, an opportunity to serve Christ, to follow Christ, and to follow God. Herodias, Mark chapter 6, verse 17. She's another, these are all the bad mothers. I've got to get the bad mothers out of the way. She was cheating on her husband. And basically, what she really was doing, she was marrying two men. She was, marrying, she was married to one person, and then she decided to marry her brother as well. So she was just, you know, ah, it's, it's, I can do whatever I want. I can marry two people, it's no problem. And John the Baptist comes on the scene. Anybody heard of John the Baptist? And he said that what you're doing is wrong. And he told that to Herod, and he told that to Herodias. They were both living in sin. It's wrong. You can't do that. You can't have sex with this person and that person. It's against God's word. And John was telling him that. Just like God tells us that through the scriptures, you have to do things a certain way. And therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him. Now, you, I, know, I can do whatever I want. My body's my property. My blah, 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 blah. I'm in charge. She started yelling at him. And it says that she would have killed him but she could not. So now we have her daughter comes on the scene. And we got to look at this carefully in Mark chapter 6, verse 22. Her daughter came and danced and pleased Herod. Okay, I want you to think about this right now. She is married to Herod, okay? Herodias is married to Herod. And Herodias brings her daughter to dance before her husband. I mean, is somebody, go is somebody screw loose here? That's wrong. You don't do that. Somebody, you guys crazy or something? You know, you don't just, sure, just, oh, she, she can dance before, she can strip naked before, and I don't care. She came and danced and pleased Herod, and the king was so pleased that he granted a request and promised her up to half his kingdom. My goodness. And this shows you how numb Herodias' daughter was. She went to her mom and said, Mom, what should I ask for? And Herodias said, Ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And she's like, Okay, sure. I have no problem killing somebody. I have no problem murdering somebody. You see, right and wrong was not influenced and put into her child. And Herodias had an opportunity to respond. John the Baptist gave her an opportunity. He said, what you're doing is wrong. That is an opportunity. 
Whether we like it or not, you don't, you don't like Jesus telling us what to do. We don't like the Bible telling us what to do. But it is an opportunity for you to respond and say, Jesus, what would you have me do? And her daughter was twice as bad as her mother. And that's what happens. You see, things don't get better. They get worse. And I see it. When, when the youth of Lake Elsinore come here, I see the trouble and the hurt and their parents are dead because they're just living in sin. It's not good. It's awful. And I sit there and I cry at the stories they tell me. They go to school and their friends are just cussing out the teacher. Nobody's listening. Nobody's teaching their kids to do what is right. There is a right and wrong. Goliath's mother, Goliath, Herodias, Herodias' daughter. Here we have two women who did not influence their children for what was right, but for what was wrong. This picture of the lady I showed you, she's not just a prisoner. She's a prisoner for a reason. Uh, she and her boyfriend left, were in a house, and they wanted to, and I'm sorry, there's kids in here. They wanted to have sex. So they left the boy in the house, and there was a bathtub filled with water, and the boy went in the bathtub, and he drowned. Because they were doing their thing, probably doing drugs too, because she was a drug user. You know, come on, folks. We can't live this way. And this, is, this kind of neglect is going on a lot in homes. And not to this extent... But it's still happening. Parents don't care about what is being put into their child. It's awful. They didn't call 911 or seek medical attention. The child was missing for months because they hid the body. What? She was a consistent drug user. And if you hear some of her uh, talking while... You know, she didn't know they were recording her. You, you'd have to think, what is going on in people's heads today? And God is asking us that. What, what, how are you going to influence your child for right? You're in charge. You have a responsibility. Are you going to influence them for what is right? Are you going to influence them to what is according to God's word? It's so important as parents. It's, and if we, when we stand before Christ, we need to know that, and this is, this is John the Baptist talking. This is just, you got to know that what you're doing is wrong. It says in Luke 17 verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown in the sea. A lot of you have probably heard, already heard this. And it says that if we should offend one of these little ones. Little ones are so important. The Bible says they're the greatest in the kingdom of God. Our children are the greatest in the kingdom of God. They are the most important. When they, come, when, when they are conceived, they are the most important thing. And in America, they should be the most important thing. Children first. Good mother. Here we go. Now, okay, we can all calm down now. All right? Got the good mother. This is the good mother. Luke 131. The angel comes to Mary. This is Mary. And she says, You will bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. Luke 138. What did she reply? She said, Be it unto me, or whatever you say, God, I will respond. Be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So here, God is getting, giving her an opportunity, and she is responding rightly. She's saying, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Herodias was given an opportunity, and she did not make the right decision. As parents, we've got to take his word seriously. Jesus Christ, he had a family. He had a father, Joseph. Now we know who his real father was. It was God. Mary, he had brothers, James, Joseph's 
Simon and Judas, and the Bible says he also had sisters. So he's growing up in a normal family, normal family life. And I just want you to understand that part. And John 7 verse 5, we want to also understand that it says, Even his brothers, James, Josie, Simon, Judas, did not believe in him. They did not believe he was the Son of God. They didn't believe. And you also have to, we also want to be reminded, Mary was there when Jesus was a newborn. She was there when the angel came to her and said, you're going to have a baby. She was there in the end when she gave birth to this child and the shepherds came and the angel was there and the wise man came. She was there. Probably the biggest, greatest witness of all time of Jesus Christ is that woman because she was there for everything. As a boy, when he was in the temple, she was there trying to find him because he left. When Jesus began his ministry, she was there. And she was also there when, she, when he died on the cross. In John chapter 19, verse 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. There she is. His mother. And I want to make a point here, but I want to make sure we understand where this lady's at. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 through 2. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James. James is one of her sons, brother of Jesus. Bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. So Jesus had just died and he was going to rise. And they, they didn't know he was going to rise, but they went to anoint him. So here is Mary again seeking Jesus Christ. And they spoke to the angel at the tomb. They met Jesus. They spoke to the angel and they met with Jesus and started talking to them. And when they met Jesus, they went back to the apostles and the disciples and brought word to them that Jesus was alive. These mothers, these wonderful mothers, these women brought word to the apostles, the wonderful big apostles, the men. And when Jesus left, it says the Bible, and that He ascended, when they went to Jerusalem, it says they went up to the upper room where the disciples were. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there again with His... Who? Who's this now? Who's that? The brothers. The brothers that didn't believe, now they're there. To experience this. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes and there's this big event that happens this day. I don't, you probably, some of you may not know the story, but this is a huge event. And the Holy Spirit came and He filled people. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there getting filled with the Holy Spirit. The brothers were there getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Here we have a mother who is following Jesus Christ. She is teaching her children by example. Children, I'm following Jesus. I bore Him. I was there at every stage. You can bet this guy is for real. So she was there at the cross, at the tomb, in Jerusalem. And she was also part of the early church. And it affected her children. You see here, Mary is given an opportunity to influence her children. And she is doing it right. She is following Jesus Christ. Before, they didn't believe. But in Galatians 1.19, it says, Paul saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. See, James is now part of the early church. Jesus' brother found out that Jesus was for real. His brother, who he grew up with. Some of the writers of the New Testament were brothers of Jesus Christ. And they started out with a very humble statement. They said, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine growing up with a brother, a son, and all of a sudden they turn out to be God? That's very humbling. You really have to stop and say, I believe in this man Jesus Christ. He's more than just my brother. He's more than just my son. You see, mother, 
uh, Mary, she had to humble herself. She didn't think she was this glorious person. She wasn't divine. God just used her. And she followed Christ. So here we have Mary. The angel comes to her and says, Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. And her response was, Be it unto me according to your word. Mary's response, the mother of Jesus Christ, was the right response. She followed Jesus Christ. And it had an effect on her children. And that's what we need in our nation today. That's what mothers and fathers need to do today. We've got to follow Jesus Christ just like Mary, just like James, just like the brothers. We have got to follow. We've got to respond. 